Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a ranked perfumers portfolio video, which I am absolutely stoked to do for everybody because this is one of my favorite perfumers in the game and I think one of the greatest perfumers of all time. Definitely one of the uh, most influential perfumers you could say uh, and that is Michel Almarac, master perfumer. Um, some of my all-time favorite fragrances ever were created by him. Uh, but before we dive into him and his work, we are going to do some unboxings today. And so the very first one is actually from a brand. So this was a gift and um, it's, it was from John from January Scent Project. So thank you very much, John. John reached out and he basically said, hey man, I've been enjoying your content and I would love to send you a sample set if you ever get around to talking about it on the channel. You have no obligation, say whatever you want. Um, and said, absolutely. Yeah, send it on. So let's see what a sample set looks like. I've never seen one of these before. I've actually never smelled a January scent project fragrance before. I know Rich Mitch, um, my buddy Rich Mitch did a, my uh, fragrance brother from across the pond. He did a, uh, couple early impression videos dedicated to this house. And I also know that Galen um absolutely loves this house and that is again january scent projects this is what the sample set looks like and ah very nice samples enclosed enjoy greeting from rhode island hoping they find you well john very kind very kind handwritten note beautiful touch um can't uh, can't wait to dive into these with everybody ah look they even came with smelling strips how uh how thoughtful, how thoughtful indeed. Should get some January scent uh, project tags on these, John. That would be cool. Ah, each one has a card. Nice. Uh, that's kind of a cool idea. This is kind of like uh, Nishan 8 has those postcards enclosed in their, in their boxes. Cool idea. Um, so I guess this is all of them. Does come with a card. And just so everyone knows, I did invite John on to the channel, just like we did a chat with Clandestine Laboratories and with Liz Moores of Papillon. So we did one with Mark Sage of Clandestine Laboratories, uh, Liz Moores of Papillon, Russian Adam of Arige La Dore. I asked John if he wanted to come on the channel and do an interview, and he said yes. And I said, first, I have to get to know your work, though. So I guess what we will do is we will spend... Um, the next week or so kind of going through these getting to know them i can either do a live stream let's see there's one two three four five six seven eight nine so there's nine so we could do a live stream where we maybe test six uh on skin and i could maybe wear you know the other three just as my scent of the day and do individual videos on them so one of these is vaporo syndro i think this is called vaporo syndro um, I know nothing about these, so I'm coming in completely and utterly blind, if you will. Um, and 2017 release, green floral, coffee, turmeric. Ooh, turmeric can be a scary note if it's not used right. Mahogany, cumin, and oud. Sound interesting, though. Ambergris. Um, I assume that he's using real ambergris. And um, I don't know the pricing on these, though. I, I, I literally know nothing about the house, so we'll have to kind of explore together. And then we've got, I guess this is going to be all of them, is my guess. Uh, Smolder Rose. Smolder Rose. And Smolder Rose is a 2017 release. Damask Rose. Choya uh, Nak. Elderflower, labdanum, oud, frankincense, saffron, bergamot, patchouli, cave juniper. I like that there's some different notes in there. Uh, it seems very artistic. Seems, um, you know, it seems like uh, you don't see elderflower in a fragrance every day. And that's what I expect when I buy something niche, indie, you know, something different. You don't want just the usual pink pepper, patchouli, vetiver, you know, when you buy a, a fragrance like, like this. So, I'm liking the note listings. Let's see. Denudist. Denudist? These are interesting names, I'll tell you that. Denudist? Uh, Denudist is caramel. Ooh, scary caramel. Jasmine, Narcissus, Oak Moss, Marine Notes. Caramel, Jasmine, and Marine Notes. 
amber beeswax, bergamot, celery seed, patchouli, vetiver, and white genepi. Interesting. Um, and then we've got uh, Eater Rantler. Eater Rantler. I'm probably completely mispronouncing these. Uh, Eater Rantler, Rantler is a green scent. Lavender, LME, fir cone, green leaves, ivy, moss, provincial lavender, cashmere, uh, which anytime you see cashmere, think uh, cashmoran, champaca leaf, hay, musk, oak wood, vetiver, pink, and pink pepper. Uh, I'm just marking these that I have them as decants while we go along, so I remember. Uh, Horla. Horla. Oh, shit. I probably just broke one. Did I just break one? Nope. It lived. It survived the fall. Um, at least I think it survived the fall. Maybe it didn't. Oh, shit. Maybe I did break it. Are you leaking? Are you injured, my, my friend? I think you might be injured. Yes, I think you might be injured. We have, an, we have a man down. We have a man down, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I'll set you aside first. This was uh, Serin. Serin. Yeah, definitely. Look at the juice level, for sure. He's wounded. We have a wounded warrior. I'll have to do an early impression video on this one very soon, I guess. Uh, here, let me, let me put this right here, just so I don't forget. Yeah, I can smell it on my hands. Unfortunate, we have a casualty already. Um, so let me mark Serin. 2019 release that one was. Maybe I'll do a, a quick hit video on that one tonight. A late night insight. Smells good though. Smoky floral. Mmm, interesting. I like it. Okay, and then we've got um, Selperniku. Selperniku. I gotta ask him about these names. Selperniku. Butter, apricot, cypress, immortelle, cardamom, chamomile, juniper, milk, petit gras, sandalwood, and tobacco. And then the one I've been looking forward to the most is Bervuvu. This is the one that uh, everyone says they think I would like the, the most uh, because I believe it has castorium in it, if memory serves. Bervuvu is 2018 geranium, basil, castorium, ginger, henna, mushrooms, Texas cedar, it's made for me. Tonkin musk, Virginia cedar, amber, honey, patchouli, rose, and white cedar. Interesting. Uh, the note listing sounds amazing. I bet you I will end up liking that. And then we've got, uh, what are you? You are, did I already say Horla? I think I already said Horla. Horla was a 2020 release. Aldehydes, vanilla, almonds, bergamot, camphor trees, kumarin, ylang ylang, milk again, bay leaf, civet, coffee. Interesting. Sandalwood. Uh, patchouli, vetiver, viburnum blossom. Never heard of that before in my life. And then we've got gong. The final one is gong. This is Rich Mitch's fragrance. He's the one with the gong. Um, and gong is a 2021 release. Amber, bergamot, blueberry, ginger, green pepper, Japanese radish. There's a note I've never seen in a perfume before. Leather, lime, musk, sandalwood, Thai ginger, and violet. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. So again, thank you, John. That was very kind of you and already haven't even got a chance to spray one yet. I've already broken one. Uh, it must have came out of the top because it looks like the juice is staying in there. Okay, so I'll try to do a, before I lose all the juice, I'll try and do a review on that one or an early impression video on that one first. All right, good stuff. I am very, very excited uh, to dip into these. Thank you for uh, thinking of me and reaching out and uh, sending me this. So yes, and again, I told John that uh, all opinions are my own and that I basically reserve the right to say whatever I want about them. If they're great, I'll tell you they're great. If I think they're shite, I'll tell you they're shite. Um, and that's just the way it, it's. It, that's just the way it is with Channel Ram. Um, if anyone sends me anything, I always try to stay completely neutral. The fact that they sent me a. $50 sample set or whatever has no bearing on, you know, what I say about them. Uh, same thing if I ever get a free bottle, which is very, very rare. But if it ever does happen, has no bearing on what I say about the scent. Okay, this is the big one I've been waiting for. This is from everyone's favorite vintage uh, lover uh, who has been sending me stuff lately, uh, Armando. Armando uh, sent me an entire blind sniff session recently. And... Um, 
Unfortunately, we were going to do two sessions. There were 12 fragrances. The first blind sniffing episode that I did from those, um, from those fragrances that he sent me was an absolute barn burner. I had such a blast doing that video. Uh, so I just, I can't, I can't, couldn't wait for round two, but unfortunately the numbers came off. He sent me a key and everything and, and blind sniffing fragrances is like my favorite way of, of getting to know perfume. I've done, I actually have a, um, playlist. You can go click on blind sniffing and learn about them. So this has the rest of the blind sniffs. Number 10 has changed. So we will do a part two of the blind sniffing stream here. Thanks again, Armando, for doing this, man. You're, you're an absolute legend as far as I'm concerned. Um, and become a very good friend as of late. And I bought some stuff from him. And so this is the stuff I bought with what looks like some extra stuff. As Armando is a very generous chap. He loves sharing his collection. And uh, so this is a fragrance that I actually have never smelled before. He very kindly sent me the first version of this. Uh, but I've never smelled this. This is Aramis Perfume Calligraphy Rose. Do you guys know this one? Aramis Perfume Calligraphy Rose. It smells good from the atomizer. Very rosy um, from the atomizer. I'll be interested to try that one out. That um, The one that he sent me, let's see if I can pull it up real here, real quick here. Perfume Calligraphy Rose, 2013. Saffron, Honeysuckle, Oregano. I remember the original calligraphy series here. Let me just grab it since I've been talking about it so much. Um, the original perfume calligraphy series he sent me is this one right here. And this has a saffron blossom note in it. So this has saffron and you can definitely get that Middle Eastern saffron. They blended it with oregano, which what came out a year before this? Uh, interlude which used an insane oregano note. So I'm sure they were taking cues from Interlude's oregano opening to try to make it seem Middle Eastern. So there's saffron, honeysuckle, oregano, Turkish rose, absolute, myrrh, styrax, French lavender, frankincense, labdanum, ambergris, and musk. So this is um, a discontinued Aramis. So very good. I feel like I need to, um, I feel like I need to grab the final one, the perfume calligraphy saffron. Now that, uh, he very kindly sent me the first two, so I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Um, and this, oh, this. So if you were on that live stream, there was one fragrance that dominated. And actually, uh, if you go back and watch it, you'll, 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 you'll pick up on the fact that as soon as I sprayed it, instantly I was like, what is this and why do I not have it? How did you find this, Armando? And, and this is what it is. He said it's extremely rare and hard to find. And I mean, we looked everywhere. We were looking in places, uh, the deepest parts of Eastern Europe and uh, just all over. We were looking all over the, the globe. Very few bottles of this exist. So even just him sending me this, uh, this mini is way too kind, extremely kind. Um, and I know he was saying that he was wanting to uh, pare down his collection and only wear his favorites and all this, but still, that is very... Very kind of you, mate. Um, so this is a fragrance that I raved over. Go watch that live stream back. Again, I had no clue what anything was. So it was completely blind. I didn't know the brand, didn't know the name, didn't know the year, vintage, niche, you know, expensive, cheap, nothing. It's just completely blind. That's how I love sniffing fragrances. And I uh, put this on my skin. Hashish Om. And instantly I was like, Holy wow, I need this. And I went to go try to buy a bottle actually, and I thought I secured one, um, but it was the it was the uh, aftershave. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait to try to find the true eau de toilette. Someone, you know, someone out there has a bottle of the eau de toilette, even if it's a partial. Uh, I want the one that, that says Hashish Om. And Hashish Om came out in 19... And look how they used to do it back in the day. Uh, and I, you know, I understand sample sets are expensive and all this, but the houses would make a literal miniature bottle. Uh, and that was your sample. That was your freebie. This is what they used to give away for free. Hmm, man, this really took me. 
Uh, this really grabbed me whenever I wore it for the first time. Uh, this was, let me get the note listing, H-A-S-C-I-S-H. I remember, um, I remember just how aromatic and green it was. Instantly I knew it was a vintage from that Artemisia, but that leathery castorium dry down, it gets me every time, every single time. That's, these are my heart fragrances. I mean, these are the ones that are closest to my heart. Stuff like this and Antaeus and the Animalic Civet of Koros and stuff like that. I mean, those are my loves, you know. The 80s is my decade. This is 1983, and of course it's discontinued, um, but uh, it, it does have a floral heart. There's some geranium, jasmine, carnation, but old school florals, you know, nothing that would, uh, no, nothing that would put, I don't think, somebody off unless you really, really hated florals, but it's done very well here with the woods, leather, Oh, it's so uh, aromatic and spicy and woody and green. And uh, there's even like fruity touches that go along with the floral touches. But then there's that uh, castorium, that animalic, uh, slightly metallic, warm castorium in here that just, man, this is what modern fragrances are missing. I mean, this is it. This is what this is where they've they've gone wrong. You know, missing out on that animalic element. Um, it's so good. That is so, so good. I'm a huge fan of that. Thank you, Armando. Very, very kind of you. Uh, so I think this is probably one of the ones that uh, we agreed on that I would purchase from him. And sure enough, it is. This is a Santa Maria Novella fragrance. And this is a vintage version of it, which you never see pop up online. And so Armando... Um, hit me up and I could not say no to this little beauty. Again, I looked, I've never seen this version. You hardly ever see it for sale. Um, and this brand is a brand I'm really getting into lately. So this this brand, um, it's almost like what Creed wishes they were. You know, how Creed has those stories of going back to the 1700s. Well, they go back to, to like 1221 or something insane. and And uh, actually they can trace their roots back. Uh, and so how this all started actually goes all the way back to Armando because he once sent me, and I'm going to do a full review on this one day and maybe even a comparison video with the, uh, with the modern juice. Uh, Dushan says he has secured me a bottle of the modern, which I'm very grateful for, but I still want the vintage with the gold foil. And this is Santa Maria Novella's Po de España. This got this whole Santa Maria Novella thing kicked off for me. Oh my God, this, uh, this is, when I smelled this, I was like, this is instantly the best leather fragrance, not in my collection. There's no, there's no other leather fragrance on earth that I know of that's better than this. That's not in my collection. Uh, I need this. Oh my God. It is, it, it prompted an entire video, Spanish leather versus Russian leather versus, versus, uh, modern leather. And I use like, um, you know, like suede leathers or Tuscan leather as an example of a modern leather. But, um, so this is what I got from the brand today from our, the full bottle, but I'm still hunting that, uh, Po de Spagna in vintage form. Very rare, hard to come by. Um, and it is, it is one of my true loves, but that's basically how the brand got just, you know, thrown onto my radar straight in front of my face. And so this is one of them and this is called Nostalgia. And Nostalgia, uh, they've now repackaged it in the normal Santa Maria Novella bottles. This is what it looked like originally 20 years ago or so when it came out. I think it came out 2000. Oh, you know, it has this oily, um, almost like fuel, but clean fuel, you know, uh, like you're smelling burning clean fuel somehow. And, um... This is, I will read you the notes here, Nostalgia by Santa Maria Novella, 2002 release, and it's birch and leather. So again, that combination of birch and leather, mm. patchouli, styrax, which can come off very waxy, um, the styrax can come off very waxy. 
with tobacco. And I mean, you're just like, at, you're, you're naming all of my favorite notes right there. It's leathery, spicy. It's got that dry, uh, resinous tobacco. And then you add the woods, Virginia cedar with a little bit of vanilla to keep it. Oh, you know, just a scent that uh, I knew I couldn't pass up. So thank you, Armando. I know you could have probably sold this for much more uh, on eBay or something. And you can see even the bottom is like individually numbered. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful presentation by Santa Maria Novella. Fantastic presentation. Love it. Love it. Oh, it's so, it's so good too. Uh, he sent me a decant. And so I have got a chance to try it before. I have not talked about it on the channel, but I have got a chance to try it before. And the second one that uh, we agreed upon that I purchased from him. And he uh, was a little reluctant to let this go. And I can absolutely see why. This was on my blind sniff video as well. It was the very first one. And I had smelled it before. Cullen from uh, Japan actually made me a decant, and I think this is from a little different bottle. I'll have to go back and take a look at the bottle, but he made me a decant, and I really loved it. It's like a cross between, think about a cross between, you know, uh, Robert P. Gay's Bandi and maybe something like, uh, like this. This is Etros Goma. So we're talking about some of my favorite leathers of all time, right? Etros Goma, which this also came from Armando. Um, and you would get to Signor Vivada by the house of Emilio Pucci. And so this is a vintage bottle. Uh, look at the atomizer. Look at that. How retro is that? Um, oh, and the smell, I mean, instantly one of my favorite leathers. Absolutely instantly one of my favorite leathers. Um, blessed to have this and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's my kind of fragrance. It's just 100% my kind of fragrance. Um, the notes are Senor Vivada. I'm trying to type around this box here. Senor Vivada from Emilio Pucci, 1970. Oh, that's right. I forgot. They actually don't, uh, they don't have a note listing on Parfumo. Let me, let me pull it up in base notes for you guys. Let's see if Base Notes has a note listing. Just out of curiosity, for those interested in maybe trying to hunt down a bottle, it's Emilio Pucci, P-U-C-C-I, and Signor Vivara is 1970 release. Base Notes says that it's Aldehydes, Artemisia, Bergamot, Galbanum, and Coriander with Carnation, Iris, je Iris, and Leather. I'm telling you, that is a winning combination in my book. If I ever create a fragrance, it will be an Iris Leather. I'll have to have an Iris Leather in there. Uh, cinnamon, Sandalwood, Patchouli, Vetiver, Amber, Leather, Moss, Myrrh, Castorium, Musk, and Costas. Oh, what a fragrance, man. Okay, and then another freebie. Obviously, Armando is way too kind. Uh, let's see what this is. Uh, I, I just said I had to get the third one, and here it is. The complete collection of Aramis uh, Calligraphy Saffron. Oh, that'll make a great, that'll make a great review. Um, thanks again, mate. Seriously, you did not have to, especially these full bottle freebies. That's very, very kind of you. Seriously, I, they will get the, um, they will get the love and attention they deserve on my channel at some point. Uh, but honestly, all I want to do is wear these vintages now. And I am wearing a vintage fragrance today. Uh, speaking of vintage fragrances, let me just real quick update the Aramis Calligraphy Calligraphy Saffron, or else, or else it'll be, it won't be in the system with its friends, which the Saffron is uh, Marigold, Bergamot, Saffron, Turkish Rose, Absolute, Lavender, Styrax, Tonka Bean, and Vetiver. And I think this will probably end up being my favorite because rumor is that this smells like a vintage perfume, that it has this vintage tinge to it between the, um, the Lavender and the rose. Um, so interesting. Good stuff, man. Thanks again. Thanks a million, Armando. Seriously, you have, um, 
I know I've said thank you, and I know I've told you thank you as well, but uh, you have added, you know, so so many vintage fragrances I basically learned about from from you, so I, I, am, I am in your debt, sir. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about Michel Almarac, and let's talk about, uh, this is going to be a top 11, and this is rank. So I've done a Michel Almarac perfumer's portfolio video, but the whole idea of, you know, of the perfumer's portfolio video was to give the perfumer the spotlight, was to give them the credit that they deserve. Uh, for many decades and decades, they were overlooked. They were pushed to the back, you know. Um, perfumers were never put on bottles like Frederick Mall ended up doing in the year 2000 when he released his uh, fragrance line. They were never given the spotlight to write briefs like uh, Amouage allowed Karine Vinchon Spanner to do on the box of stuff like Boundless. And they never got that kind of limelight in the past. And so I wanted to make this video as a way to talk about a lot of different fragrances in my collection, but in a way that adds a common thread, that adds a connection between them. And the connection is, of course, the perfumer. And I have found that whenever I find a perfumer that I like, instead of hunting down by brands, I will hunt down by the individual perfumer and just cross brands, but, but go hunt down stuff that that man or woman has made. And I have a better hit ratio doing that than buying, you know, some of my favorite brands. And so that's where this video idea ended up coming from. And so we have a top 11 with one maybe on the list, almost like an honorary mention. And I'll tell you how it worked out that way here in a second. But first, I want to read a little blurb about um, Michelle Almarac. And I'm going to read this directly from the Parfumo website. So interesting facts. It says, there is no better way for a perfumer to start his life than to be born in Grasse. Michel Almarac was born in the world capital of fragrances in 1953. After graduating from school, he attended the legendary Ruhr Bertrand DuPont Academy, which later became the elite school for the Givaudan Group. His most notable professional stations led him to the Japanese Takasago International Group, which is an important stop. We'll talk about that here later on. Uh, his most, um, one of the leading companies in the Asian fragrance sector is Takasago. This was followed by professional engagements at Creations Aromatiques, which I think is his company, if I'm not mistaken, or he founded it with somebody, maybe. I have to go look up the full story, but I think he's tied to Creations Aromatiques in some way, which created great perfumes for Burberry and Escada, amongst others. Michel Almarac then moved to Drum Fragrances, which has been part of the Givaudan Empire since 2019. In the late 1990s, he was recruited by Robertet in Grasse, which led him back to his hometown. Some of his most successful and famous creations to date are Casimir for Chopard, never spelled it, Parco uh, Piladano 7 for Bottega Veneta, never spelled it, Chloe, never spelled it, Gucci Rush. Uh, I actually prefer, interestingly enough, uh, Azaro Visit. For Michel Almarac, fragrances are not only a profession, but are his life. Since 2016, the perfume business has also been a family affair in the Almarac house. Together with his two sons, Benjamin and Romain, he founded the label Parlemois de Parfum, which I've never smelled any of their work. That just goes to show there are, as a fragrance lover, and I've talked about this before, but there is a wealth of riches now for us to smell. There's so many houses. It seems like every week, 10 houses get founded. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, there, there's fragrances being listed every day. I looked on Parfumo today. There were 15 new Zerzhoff fragrances that got put up in one day. Now, some people are saying, oh, that's Zerzhoff re-releasing the Kemi fragrances in their own line. But still, I mean, it's stuff like that. Every day you're seeing new releases, new stuff, new houses forming, perfumers founding their own houses. And so... Uh, there is a ton of stuff to smell. The problem is there's not a ton of quality stuff to smell. And that's why I go to the past. That's why I go backwards. To go forwards with the perfume world, you have to go backwards. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. If you want to learn about the history of fragrances, the way to really move your intellect of fragrances and how we got to where we are today is not by smelling, you know, the... the, the um, first to come niche house or, you know, these overpriced, um, you know, uh, niche houses and 
sometimes I enjoy some of that, but more and more I'm losing interest, especially as I smell more and more of their work. Everything starts to smell the same. They're using the same aroma chemicals from the same big oil houses. And, um, you know, there's actually a case I was reading about last week. I can't remember the details, but I think it was European regulators are investigating the uh, oil houses like Givaudan and, and uh, IFF for collusion, almost like monopolistic collusion, uh, which is not surprising to me at all. But, um, it, you know, that's kind of the world we live in. So going backwards in time is where you um, can find some gems like this that uh, you'll never smell something like this in modern perfumery, ever. Ever. Oh, Jesus. I mean, it's so good. Especially as a, as a leather lover, these two are just spot on my taste. And um, so, yes. So, um, I was just... I was going off on a tangent because uh, we mentioned these fragrances from him that I've never smelled. And there's a ton of them, you know, just, just goes to mention the ones that uh, Parfumo points out as some of his most successful and famous creations I've never smelled. I have my own taste. Um, so it says, for Michel, Amarac fragrances are not only a profession, but are his life. Since 2016, the perfume business uh, has been a family affair. Okay, I read that. Parle de Parfum, I've never smelled any of those. The flagship store in Paris is intended to be a mixture of laboratory show perfumery for those interested and of course an insider tip for the ultimate shopping experience in the realm of beautiful fragrances. The perfumes that Michel Amarat creates there are free of any specifications from demanding clients. They correspond solely to his ideas of the perfect fragrance without having to serve a marketing strategy in the back of his mind. Interesting that one of those fragrances smells like you know, a fragrance which we'll talk about as we get through the, this top 11 that was made by one of those uh, demanding clients. Um, this freedom, according to the master himself, is priceless and a luxury he enjoys, but sustainability is also one of the precepts according to which Parlamois de Parfum works. There don't seem to be many challenges left for a true legionnaire like Michel Amarek. He still sees... Them in production of contemporary men's fragrances, these would always offer less scope than classic perfumes for ladies. His latest major coup, however, suggests that he still manages this difficult exercise easily. The Eau de Parfum for Brioni, another brand I've never smelled, launched in 2021 and was effortlessly successful. Okay, so there you go. Multiple examples of, of uh, the wealth of, of riches. I've never smelled Parlement de Parfum. I've never smelled Brioni. Um, and, and so there's so many things to smell as a frag head. You can't own or smell everything, even though we all want to, but, um, you have to kind of hone in on what you like. So speaking of honing in on what I like, I wore today a vintage that gets almost no hype, almost no love, but I think it should. And when I say the house, you're going to close, you're going to close your ears. It's not Avon, don't worry, but it is Revlon. And Revlon made a fragrance in 1984 called French line. And other than the kind of terrible bottle with this weird kind of rubber thing on the front, um, it is a splash. So this particular one is a splash. Uh, and huh. so this is spicy. Animalic, green, sharp, uh, but there's beautiful musky uh, powdery orris root touches in here with uh, artemisia, bergamot, basil, coriander, lemon, carnation, jasmine, caraway, orris root, rose, musk, patchouli, amber, castorium, and leather. So if you go to Parfumo and read a review, there was a guy that wrote a very well written review, but he says coconut multiple times. There's no coconut in here. Uh, that is a mistranslation from the um, from from the uh, databases. It's supposed to be castorium. If you see coconut in the base of an 80s fragrance, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's supposed to be castorium. It's some sort of a weird mistranslation. There's no coconut in here. There's no coconut in Santos de Cartier. Um, you know, if you click on coconut, you see all these 80s fragrances, SAR, and there's no coconut in any of those. Um, and But when you smell this, if you think about it as castorium, it'll make perfect sense. There is this... Um, there is this powdery orris root that's very well done. 
because it's not too much. It's just perfectly blended with the florals and that masculine, ambery, leathery, castorium dry down. Fantastic stuff. And again, I think I got an absolute steal on this. This is a 120 mil bottle, 125 mil. And I think I paid like 50 bucks. Um, and because no one hypes these. So with these old vintage fragrances, sometimes you can find these. Sometimes you can find these that weren't hyped, you know, and, um, and just get a steal. Just get an absolute gem. The, these these three vintages that I just mentioned, or you could add four if you add hashish om, but good luck finding it, right? Uh, but these type of fragrances are gonna are gonna beat anything new that you're gonna come across. You're not gonna smell stuff like this. And and with what the houses are putting out nowadays, go buy anything from LVMH or Puyge or anything like that. You're not gonna compete with that. So that's why I'm excited to try stuff like John's work. You know, like. Um, January Scent Project, Clandestine Laboratories. I've talked about some of these houses. I've enjoyed getting to know their work, Russian Adams' work. Um, you know, that's the what that's the path that my interest is taking me. Either kind of off the beaten path uh, brands um, that are indie and free to kind of do their own creative process or vintages. So French Line was my scent of the day. All right, let's do this top eleven. So here's the question mark. The question mark is this, and the reason it's remaining a question mark is on Parfumo, there are two people listed as the uh, perfumer for Fahrenheit. One is a gentleman named Maurice Roger, who was a uh, gigantic uh, face of, uh, of perfumery. Uh, he, I believe, actually was a uh, director at Dior or, or uh, was almost like the big kahuna at Dior when Pierre Bourdon... Uh, went to make J'adore. And, um, but if you go to Parfumo and look at Fahrenheit, it actually says Maurice Roger and Jean-Louis Suizak, who's one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Jean-Louis Suizak made, you know, a handful of some of my favorite fragrances ever. And um, so Fahrenheit does not have Michelle Almorac's name on it, on Parfumo. However, the reason that this is in the maybe camp, and if, to be quite frank, if this actually is a Michelle Almarac creation, this would uh, skyrocket to the number one spot. I could not put anything ahead of this. This is one of the greatest fragrances ever created. And even in its current iteration, this is a 2014 bottle. This is a 2014 bottle for TO2 uh, or 2012. I can't remember. 14 or 12. Um, it is fantastic. It is just that violet leaf gasoline opening uh, the, the branding of the bottle and the box and the name and the way the fragrance wears and, you know, that leathery dry down. There's so many florals in here, but the way that they're blended, you know, uh, if you're not a floral lover, you can still easily wear this. You'd be shocked to see how many florals are in here. Hawthorne, Lily of the Valley, Carnation, Honeysuckle, Chamomile, I mean, just all kind of florals, but it doesn't smell floral at all. It smells like the height of masculinity. Um, and that leathery dry down, man. Oh, what a fragrance. And I've got uh, multiple. I'm going to do a Fahrenheit comparison video between an 80s bottle, a 90s bottle, and this 2000s bottle. So uh, that'll be a hell of a video one day. But it has to stay kind of as an honorary mention since I don't know for sure if Michelle Almarac uh, was involved in, in Fahrenheit. Uh, Fragrantica says he was, is the thing. That's the reason it's a maybe. Parfumo doesn't, but Fragrantica does. So we're just going to put it as a honorary mention uh, into the side and not in the ranked list. Okay, so number 11. Number 11 is going to be a freshie. And you guys know, as a frag head, it's very hard to get excited about freshies. Freshies are one of those things that I almost feel like you wear it because of the climate, you know, it's a hot day or something. You want to be climate appropriate. Most frag heads don't love freshies. And, but this is an example of a very well done freshie, I have to admit. This is Sculpture Om. And Sculpture Om is nothing to write home about. It's nothing that's going to, um, you know, it's nothing that's going to uh, wow you as a frag head. I don't think there's anything in here that will really grab you. When you spray it, though, you're going to get a big orange blossom. It's it's like orange blossom with some sweetness. And um, 
some florals, but citruses as well with the orange blossom. And that orange blossom gives it a very fresh, the image that comes to my mind when I, um, and this is supposed to be a sale, by the way. So the image that comes to my mind whenever I wear this is imagine you actually are sitting on a sailboat or walking the beach or something like that. And you're in one of those white shirts that uh, you only wear in summer. And, you know, it uh, it's partially see-through, but you're on vacation, you're walking the beach, and you just have this very relaxed, carefree attitude because you're on vacation, right? And you're just, you're not worrying about work, not worrying about the outside world, you're just shutting everyone out, and you want to wear something that's clean and fresh and invigorating, citrusy, slightly floral. This is what I would reach for. Uh, perfect for something like that. It's just a very carefree, relaxed summer citrus scent. Uh, there is a Tonka bean, ambery, benzoin, you know, slightly woody dry down, but mostly what you're going to get is that orange blossom, which gives it that fresh, you know, almost like fresh, clean sheet vibe with um, geranium and florals and lily of the valley and jasmine and rose. And it's a, it's, it's, it's pretty floral, but it's also fairly sweet. The Tonka bean and the amber gives it a little bit of sweetness to it. So it's a kind of a mass appealing you know, uh, freshy, if you will, but I think it's very well done. And that came out in 1995 from the house of Nikos, house very few people talk about, that's Sculpture Ohm, that's a cheapie. Uh, I think it's still available. Okay, next on the list is from 2014, and the reason this is here is this is basically one of many times that Michel Almarek has remade the original Gucci uh, Pour Ohm from 2003, which is much higher on the list. So I couldn't put this any higher because it's kind of like him redoing his work for a different brand um, and changing a couple notes. And then he did it again for Parlemois de Parfum. He made a fragrance that smells very much like the original uh, Gucci Pour Homme 1 from 2003. And so this one's from 2014. This is number 10 on the list. Sculpture for Homme, Sculpture Pour Homme was uh, number uh, 11. This is number 10. This is Bentley for Men Absolute. Now, if you go to Parfumo, and type in Bentley for Men, you will see the absolute, but you will see that it has like a golden top right here. So mine's black, that one's gold. There's no difference between the two other than the gold one, I think was made for the Middle Eastern market or something, or maybe the black one was made for the Middle Eastern market. I don't exactly remember. Um, but if you go on to Parfumo and plug this in, you'll see it says it was last marketed by Lalique Group Arts and Fragrances. So this is discontinued. So now he's now if you want this DNA and you just want to go buy it, you have to go to the Parlemois de Parfum version, um, which I believe is called uh, Papyrus Oud. Yeah, it's called Papyrus Oud. Uh, so, but this does feel like it has papyrus in here because I think it does. It's papyrus, frankincense, pink pepper, ginger, atlas cedar, sandalwood, amber, oud, and moss which is a different note listing than Gucci Pour Homme 1. But there are interviews with Michel Amarak and his son where they claim that the formula is almost identical. It's just the quality of the ingredients that have kind of changed. They've kept the formula the same, basically, is what he said. Um, which is interesting because this shows oud in Bentley for Men Absolute. There's no oud in Gucci Pour Homme 1, or none that's listed anyways, right? Um, some people say that this has a note of uh biscuits like biscuits in the heart like you almost get this freshly baked biscuit i've never smelled that before but i've heard some people say that uh if you like this style you could also check out Comme des garçons two man that's a fragrance that you know feels a little bit different mark buxton made that but it, it feels like it plays in the same sandbox if you will um yeah, but this woody, spicy, smoky, perfect for the cooler weather. Um, this is considered basically my backup of Gucci Pour Homme 1. So the reason it's at number 10 is just because it's kind of like a remake of a fragrance. And um, so I rank the original much higher. Okay, next on the list. Plus, I actually think the original smells better. I think the uh, Gucci used better ingredients is what it feels like to me, even if the... Uh, you know, the formula is the same. I think maybe Gucci using the higher end ingredients gives it also a little bit of a uh, of a push for me. Okay, so that was number 10. 
Bentley for Men Absolute from 2014. Number nine. Number nine is another cheapie. Michelle Almarak did some amazing cheapie fragrances. And this is also discontinued, which is shocking because I think it was Mont Blanc's best fragrance. And this is called Star Walker. So here's the thing about Star Walker is Star Walker you would wear for me in almost exactly the same uh, occasion as you would wear Sculpture Homme. Uh, hot day, you want to kind of relax. The difference is Star Walker does it a little bit different. So whereas uh, Nico Sculpture Ulm uses that orange blossom uh, with florals and that little bit of that Tonka sweetness, here what Star Walker does is it uses the note of bamboo, this very fresh bamboo. I've never smelled such a well-done uh, bamboo note. There's also uh, sandalwood, pink pepper, star anise, uh, just a little bit of star anise, though. I don't pick up a whole lot. Just a touch to give it some contrast. Um, with cedarwood, amber, and musk. And a little bit of ginger. So there's this gingery bamboo freshness when you spray this. And it's extremely invigorating, but also relaxing. Um, apparently they made a flanker of this. I've never smelled it. I'm very happy with just this. You know, uh, this is a great fresh before bed scent in the summer. Or if you just want to, you know, when it's hot, you just want to spray yourself 10 times with something. Um, and you don't want to waste your good fragrance. It's perfect for that. You're going to a barbecue late at night or something. And, uh, you just want to smell fresh. And I, I love Star Walker for a situation like that. Sad it's discontinued though. One of Mont Blanc, one of Mont Blanc's best fragrances in my opinion. So that's Star Walker at number uh, nine. Number eight is a vintage version of a fragrance that I think you can still buy, but I think the new version has pretty much been neutered, if, if what I hear is correct. You won't be able to see because they wrote it so small that it would be hard to pick up, but this is a Cosmere bottle of a fragrance from the house of Paloma Picasso and it's called Minotaur. So Minotaur, cool little bottle, I would say. Uh, Minotaur came out in 1992. And this is a really interesting mixture of fruits and green notes and florals with a uh, woody, slightly spicy, but also very sweet base. Uh, and the sweetness comes from vanilla. It's compared to a fragrance that I've never smelled before from the house of Roma Biagiotti. And it's called Roma Uomo, which is different from the Biagiotti Uomo from 89 that I that I absolutely love and I've been praising. It's completely different than this one. Um, this one came out in 89, which I absolutely love. And if you can find this for a great, for a decent price, I would say go for it. The one that this is supposed to smell like, though, came out in 92. And it comes in a bottle that almost looks like you're staring at the Colosseum, you know, it's got like the Colosseum arches, um, and it's got a red cap, I believe, and it's a sweet oriental fragrance. That's the one that this gets compared to. But since I have a vintage of this, I probably wouldn't go for the uh, Roma Uomo, unless it's just a great deal fell in my lap. This is spicy, sweet, aldehydic, um, bergamot, galbanum, but it has that tarragon note in the top that I absolutely love. Every time I see tarragon in a fragrance, I always love it. And this is another case of I, I really enjoy this for the summer because it's got this fruitiness to it. You know how the Aventus pineapple in the, in the heat comes off? Uh, it's just beautiful in the heat. I love Aventus in the heat. Ditto for this. Um, the fruits in here, which I don't know what's in here. There might be there might be a touch of a pineapple accord uh, or an apple accord or something like that in the top. But you just get this general kind of fruitiness with uh, the green galvanum, which can be very resinous, and that tarragon, which can be slightly anisic, which gives kind of a slight flashback to those older masculine days. This is more of a uh, 90s, imagine the 1990s, very carefree decade, right? Lots of fresh and easy to wear fragrances. But this was before uh, the wave of aquatics really hit, right? So this is more vanillic, ambery, tonka bean, woody dry down with those fruits in the top. Beautiful fragrance, though. Love wearing this in the heat. Minotaur. And so if you can get an older Cosmere bottle, I would recommend doing that. Otherwise, maybe just avoid this one. Okay, 
Next on the list, we've got number seven. And number seven and number six went back and forth for a long time. Finally, it ended up working out this way. I just kind of went with my gut, but this e easily was almost number six. Uh, and this is Yop Om. Now, there's a little bit of controversy with this one as well, because uh, if you have watched the Pierre Bourdon did like a two hour live stream, which, uh, or not a live stream, but a video, uh, an interview, which ended up being, which ended up kind of being like the uh, premise of the book, The Ghost Perfumer. That interview was quoted in this book many a times, and I can't post it, I don't think for copyright reasons, um, but uh, if you're interested in, in, you know, watching it, just shoot me an email, um, and I'll see, I'll see what I can do. But it's a fantastic interview, two, two and a half hours of Pierre Bourdon just holding court, right? And uh, in that interview, he claims he made Yop Om, that he made it. Now, if you go to the uh, databases and you look, they actually show Michelle Almarac as the perfumer of Yop Om. So another controversy, but if you remember back in our earlier, when I read the blurb on Michelle Almarac, I mentioned he was at Takasago in the late 80s. Well, guess who else was at Takasago in the late 80s? Pierre Bourdon. Um, and that's when I think he was making stuff like, uh, uh, Bois du Portugal for Creed, which if you've ever smelled modern Bois du Portugal, it still smells really good. And part of my premise, which I think it's as good of a hypothesis as any, as any, is that because Creed has to continue to buy the oils from Takasago as part of the agreement with, uh, Bois du Portugal, that that one still smells good. Takasago still takes pride in their work. Not like some of these other houses, L'Oreal and, you know, they just reformulate everything to death or discontinue it. Um, so this is still available and it's being marketed by Coty. But the new one without the little tree right here and it's Yope is on top. So Yope is on top in the new one. Ohm is on the bottom. There's no little tree here. Uh, marketed by Coty, I would avoid. The pink color of the juice almost looks like a radioactive pink cough syrup on the new bottles. These older ones are Lancaster distributors. And that's what you want. I would recommend going for the Lancaster distributor if you can find it. Um, it is very similar to Mont Blanc Original. It's also very similar to Green Irish Tweed, but I really like this, which is a guilty pleasure for me because I usually don't like sweet fragrances. There's something about Yop Om though that in the cold, it just works. It's fantastic. Orange Blossom, Bergamot, Mandarin Orange, Lemon, Heliotrope plays a big part here because the heliotrope adds this, you know, um, Play-Doh like texture, you know, like you can just smash Play-Doh in your hand. That's what the heliotrope in here feels like with a huge cinnamon note and Lily of the Valley and Jasmine. You will get the florals, uh, vanilla. Yes. In the dry down for sure. Tonka bean, sandalwood and patchouli. It's very, it is very sweet. And, and yet, I like it. I feel like the vintage version has more detail, more nuance. Uh, it doesn't smell as like radioactive sweet as the new one. The new one, when you smell it, it just literally smells like uh, this bomb of sweetness went off. Some people say it smells like cough syrup or something like that. This one, I never got that. Is it a synthetic fragrance? Yes. But I think there's some beauty to this too. I really... Uh, I really could enjoy wearing this or original Santal. You've seen the dent I put in my original Santal bottle and that's my second bottle. So I've worn this DNA a lot. I, I normally wear it when it's really cold. I found this works the best in the cold, but honestly, I'm on a new kick of wear whatever you want, whenever you want. So maybe I'll try Yop Ohm in the summer one day and just see what happens. Okay, next on the list, that was number seven. Number six, the one that beat out Yop Ohm just barely, just barely, is a discontinued designer. Uh, and this is a discontinued designer that Michel Almarac worked with a, a lady named Mylene Alaron. I've never heard of her work before, but uh, apparently she worked with Michel Almarac to create Lalique Hommage à l'Homme Voyageur. So Voyageur is a flanker to the original Hommage uh, à l'Homme, which I think came out a couple years before this, three years before this. And um, this uses that papyrus note that I was mentioning earlier that he did so well with uh, Bentley for Men Absolute and Gucci Pour Homme One. 
It's a beautiful note, but he uses it here differently. He uses it with vetiver. And the vetiver here mixes with the oak moss and cardamom, spicy cardamom, to kind of give you a feel of something in the realm of Javoy's private label. If you ever smelled private label, you'll kind of get this um, uh, this reminder of homage à l'homme voyageur. Voyageur smells a little bit like a designer version, and um, private label smells a little bit like a niche version, which is exactly what it is. Private label came first, is the only thing. So private label came, I think, two or three years before this. Uh, but they're both fantastic fragrances, and I am extremely blessed to have this because it's discontinued and hard to find. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a very well done designer fragrance, and Lalique in general does. Yeah, they do fantastic uh, fragrances for the money. Like if you're on a budget, you can't go wrong with Lalique. Uh, Encre, the whole Encre Noir series. Uh, I would love to get the. I almost bought actually. They have a. Uh, fragrance that I think is like an online exclusive or something. It was on fragrancebuy.ca. I had it in my cart and then I ended up taking out, I think it was called Ombre. Um, what was it called? It was called Ombre. Um, Ombre Noir. Yes, Ombre Noir from 2017. It's on my wish list. I've never smelled it, uh, but apparently it's supposed to be a, a good, well-made um, designer. I've just, I've never smelled it. Uh, okay, so next on the list, we have number five. And number five is also a discontinued fragrance, but for you vintage hunters, this one uh, doesn't get hyped as much. It's 20 years old, came out in 2003. And it's from the house of uh, Rochas. And the house or the fragrance we're talking about today is going to be Louis. Sorry for the fingerprints. Let me see if I can get these off for you. Um, so this is Rochas Louis. And I will tell you something really interesting about Louis. I find similarities to Louis. So imagine for a second that... Uh, you start with a fragrance like Abbey Rouge, okay? And imagine that you start with this uh, Abbey Rouge type vanillic base, okay? Vanilla patchouli. And, but you want to mix it with something fresh. And so what do you mix it with? You mix it with something like this. Now, this is Orange Blossom. Um, this is Narrowly. Narrowly is a very expensive ingredient. Uh, and so there's narrowly in the top with with lemon, and it's that lemon mixture that gives you the Abbey Rouge with the vanillic. Imagine like Guerlainade base, right? There's a huge reminder of Abbey Rouge to me in Louis, but I think it's a fantastic fragrance. And one, hardly anyone talks about this. This is not on anyone's radar, uh, except for the big vintage guys. Uh, it is woody and it's mixed with cedar wood and sycamore wood which you don't hear very much and sweet grass with that vanilla patchouli and amber dry down but that narrowly and lemon with woods is fantastic i'm gonna wear the piss out of this this summer uh it's on the list it's on the list to wear the piss out of so uh louis by rochas comes in at number five number four is what I consider to be the most realistic incense fragrance ever made. Some would call it the greatest incense fragrance ever made. Um, I still have to smell more incenses before I crown it the greatest ever made, but I will say it's the most realistic incense fragrance I've ever smelled, and it's called Bois d'Encense by the house of Armani. So Bois d'Encense is um, a fragrance that uh, Armani kind of personally oversee, oversaw. Giorgio uh, Armani wanted to have the, the smell of kind of his childhood in the Catholic Church. And you get this peppery incense is basically what you get. You get pepper with vetiver and frankincense. And it lasts all of about an hour. Now, my bottle is a nine-year-old bottle. It, can't, it comes from 2014. I hear the new versions are even weaker, that this is stronger. But if you go back to, let's say, 
2010, 2008, 2006, 2004, those bottles were even stronger. So they've uh, gradually, uh, you know, watered it down over time. And L'Oreal is the one who owns Armani. So L'Oreal, I don't have very much faith in, but there is another from this brand, uh, from this Armani Privé line that Michelle Almarac did that I would love to smell. And it's called Queer uh, Amethyst. Queer Amethyst, I believe. Um, which I've never smelled, but I would love to smell that one day because it's a leather and I love leathers. But if you're an incense lover and you don't mind reapplying throughout the day, I usually reapply every couple hours when I wear this because it really, it really is beautiful the first 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then it slowly starts to die down. You do get this... Um, uh, labdanum resinous kind of thing that hits you late into the dry down, but I don't like to let it get there because I just reapply. But I, I think it's a fantastic fragrance if you don't mind reapplying. And I do have a hundred mils, so you know when I wear my fragrances, I, I wear them. I don't really worry about how much juice I'm using or anything like that. So every couple hours, I'll just reapply that, and it's a really enjoyable smoky incense scent. Definitely remind you of a Catholic church if you're raised Catholic. You'll get big flashbacks of um, sitting in the pews as a little boy or girl wearing that. Okay, number three. Uh, number three is, again, Michelle Almarac working with frankincense and woods. And this is uh, the aforementioned Gucci Porom 1 from 2003. Um, considered by many to be one of the greatest masculine fragrances ever created. Spicy, woody, it's got that papyrus. Basil, ginger, tarragon, bergamot, lavender, lemon, petigran, cedar, geranium, patchouli, pimento, pink pepper, sandalwood, jasmine, frankincense, amber, sage, tonka bean, vanilla, vetiver, and musk. Okay, so you notice instantly the difference in the note listing. Completely different than this. Uh, there's no oud in here. There's oud listed in here. The note listing is totally different. But the smell is almost identical to me, except for the ingredients smell higher quality here. Maybe it's because they sat in the bottle longer. I, I don't know. But um, this was last marketed by Scannon. And I think my bottle is actually a Scannon. Yes, it is. Yep, it's a Scannon. So I wouldn't worry about versions or formulations. Just if you can find this, go for it. But it's going to be very expensive. Uh, if you don't want to pay the big money, even though this was recently discontinued, I think there's probably still bottles floating around out there for a respectable price. Uh, or you could go the Parlement de Parfum route and go with um, Papyrus Oud, which I've never smelled. Never smelled anything from that brand. Um, okay, so that's 2003. So number two. Number two is one of my favorite fragrances of all time. A fragrance that uh, I would love a backup bottle of, but they are so expensive. And... Uh, this is a big designer. When you get this, you're gonna you're gonna realize what I mean by it's a big designer. It smells like a designer fragrance. But Michelle Almarac did such a great job creating this. It's Ascada Magnetism for Men in my juice levels right here. So you can see I'm in I'm in that panic mode. You know, it's all I have. Um, oh, it's so good though. It is. Um, it's got this purple soda opening. And it's tolu balsam, amber, cedar, musk, pepper, pepper tree, saffron, sandalwood, vanilla, and leather. And this is all about resins, balsams. You know, when you first spray, you're gonna you're gonna understand exactly what I mean. It's got this peppery, resinous, uh, but it opens up almost like a purple soda, if that makes sense. It's very fizzy, and I love that about it. And I think they took that from M7. If you've ever smelled M7's kind of fizzy cola opening of the vintage M7 from 2002, this is only a couple years after M7. And I think uh, Michelle Almarac borrowed a little bit of that, but man, he was firing on all cylinders. 2003, 2004, he was in the zone creating some of these scents. Gucci Pour on One, Ascada Magnetism, what a scent this is. Uh, and even though this has a little bit of this designer sweetness, it doesn't bother me because... The way they used to do sweetness 20 years ago, completely different from the, you know, boring Tonka masculine sweetness they put in everything nowadays. The sweetness in Eros is a great example of the sweetness I hate. 
uh, and this is completely different than that. So yes, it's um, oh, it's uh, it's so good. I wish I had a backup bottle, but they're very expensive. And finally, my number one fragrance from him, uh, assuming Fahrenheit is not his, right? Leaving Fahrenheit out, uh, and this should come as no surprise if you know my taste. I've mentioned this many a times as being up there with some of my favorites of all time. This is Davidoff's Zeno, and I grabbed I grabbed a couple bottles here. So I could show you the big boy. Um, and both of these are Lancasters, and you can see they're both differently done. This one actually is engraved on the bottom of the of the uh, bottle. This one is a sticker. Uh, but they're both Lancasters. They're both amazing. I would go for a Lancaster if you can. There are some people who say, ah, oh, but there's very little difference, though. Just go for the new one, you know. There's very little difference, but there is a difference. And so for that very little difference, I would take the vintage version. Uh, it's got rosewood, lavender, bergamot, clary sage, geranium rose, jasmine, lily of the valley, patchouli, sandalwood, cedar, amber, tonka, and vanilla. And I would urge you, if you're really into this hobby like I am and you want to learn more, go to Fragrantica, type in Zeno, but don't go to the fragrance, go to the articles. There's a fantastic article written on Zeno and how in 1986, when this came out, uh, basically, they used uh, Guerlain's Shalimar as an example of the base of this. So if you smell the vanilla in this and you're like, man, this really reminds me of a, of a Guerlain. It's because Shalimar was the reference point for the base, the vanilla. And then they built kind of a fragrance uh, around it, of course. And that uh, dry gothic rose in this just gets me every time. I love this fragrance. I, I absolutely adore Zeno. Tom Ford tried to, re, tried to remake it with Beau de Jour. I would take Zeno. Um, Bois 1920 tried to remake this with Bois 1920 Extreme. I would take Zeno. Um, you know, Guerlain, basically, if, if you smell Heritage and then you smell Zeno, you will see the similarities between the two. But for me, since a... Guerlain was referenced for this. I always give the props to Heritage as my as my favorite example of this because it's a Guerlain, and and you know Shalimar was the is, is a Guerlain as well. And this Shalimar was used as kind of the uh, as the reference base for Zeno, if you will. But Zeno has to get credit for being first for kind of kicking this style off in the 80s and then the floodgates opened. I mean, you got a ton of fragrances with this DNA. You got Escada Pour Homme, you got YSL Jazz, you got um, uh, even a little bit of, there is a Versace fragrance that re kind of reminds me of a little bit of a fresher take on this DNA. It's called Versace's um, Versus Womo in this blue bottle right here. Fantastic. But similar DNA, but much fresher Italian style citruses. Um, and of course I threw the cap. Okay, so that's my countdown. That's my double unboxing. Uh, thank you again to Armando for uh, the freebies and of course um, the vintages, which are very hard to find. These are gonna make a fine collection. Thank you to John from uh, January Scent Project for the sample set. Sorry, I broke one already, but it uh, looks like it's still holding tight, so we'll do an early impression video on that very soon. And uh, thanks for watching the top 11 Michelle Almarac fragrances in my collection, ranked. Do let me know what your favorites are. Let me know if I've left any of your favorite Michelle Almarac fragrances out. Uh, liking and subscribing and all that stuff does help with the algorithm, but obviously you don't have to if that's not your thing. Um, and I appreciate the support, everybody. Cheers, guys, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.